It's quarter to 12, Nigeria. We either get it right or we fall off the brink. Hello and welcome to Quarter to 12. My guest today is Rotimi Sankori, a respected journalist and also a developmental expert. Welcome to Quarter to 12, Rotimi. Thanks, Kodera. Great to be with you. Yes. Okay, so Rotimi, the reason I kind of have been chasing you all this time to try and bring you to this program is that um, I want to see if we can use your expertise to try and get a better sense of exactly what is going on across this country, particularly when it comes to some of the conflicts that um, we're seeing become either more entrenched or even more violent. So can I just start by asking you whether it has come as a surprise to you that the Northwest is now a hotbed of violence and kidnapping and robbery and that the troubles with Boko Haram, you know, over a decade now fighting the same enemy and just when we think we're making progress it seems like they sort of recalibrate their forces and launch again we've heard that boko haram might actually now be in niger state and of course you now look at the southeast and see some of the violence that is sort of taking place there is any of these things a surprise to you sadly no why not because the data has been showing us what will happen for a long time, a very, very long time. In fact, as much as 20, 25 years now, but certainly within the last 13 years, the trajectory became clearer. So explain that, because I, I don't really understand. When you say the data, which data and what trajectory? Okay. So, let's start with the Nigeria Bureau of Statistics. I mean, we'll come to issues like climate change afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the data 12 years ago showed that the number of out-of-school children in the Northwest is higher than that in the Northeast. In the Northwest, over 4 million children out of school. In the Northeast, over 3 million children out of school. This is 13 years ago. Yes. So, as those kids grow into young adulthood, 18, 21, 22, 23, significant percentages of them will be drawn to extremism and banditry. They are vulnerable to it. Why? Explain that for those who sort of don't understand these things. Because sometimes we make assumptions about linkages mm. that people can mm. make and they can't make those linkages. Obviously, not having had access to education is a problem. But poverty, hunger, malnutrition, large ungoverned spaces where there is zero government presence, the UNDP did a report on extremism some years ago, which even showed that some of these young people are not even aware that they are fighting against a state called Nigeria. That's how much those spaces are, have been abandoned and ungoverned. So essentially, anyone that can gather large groups of young men and motivate them for survival reasons can point them in any direction. And so what you're saying to me essentially is the data around um, students or, or, or children who are not in school yes. is normally a good pointer yes. to the fact that at a certain point, if things continue that way, yes. there's a ready-made army yes. waiting to be converted into whether it is criminality, whether it is extremism, that sort of thing. Yes, and it's everywhere, even in urban areas like Lagos. So broadly in Nigeria, about 70% of children that start primary school don't transit to secondary school. So that's tens of millions of kids. In an urban area like Lagos, they are drawn into things like what is called Agbero. Mm. Now, the Agbero profession, if you can call it that, is attached. And for for non Yoruba speakers, Agbero means essentially like touts. Touts, so, yes, yeah. yes. Essentially touts attached to the transport industry. Mm. 
So the transport industry in a place like Lagos extorts more or less what is called ticket money mm. worth tens of millions of naira every day. So these young people are attached to it. They're, they can make a living. They can without make a having living. Any, any skill set. Yes, without zero skill sets. And their bosses are like multimillionaires. Some people even say billionaires. Because of the dense densely populated nature of Lagos, this is possible. There is no ungoverned space in Lagos. Mm. Everywhere needs transport. Lagos is high, very dense. So that's a pathway for them. If you mm. took that away, mm. say if you doubled, quadrupled, or expanded the size of Lagos in any way mm. and took away that transport networks, those are your potential bandits or extremists straight away. Okay. But let me ask you something. You said 13 years ago the numbers in the northwest of yes. out of school children yes. were higher than those in the northeast. In the northeast. Yes. How did we then end up, if we go by your statistics mm. and what you say they normally should tell us mm. about things, mm. how come we ended up with extremism? In the northeast, to begin Lake Chad, with, the yes. collapse of Lake Chad. Mm. The collapse of Lake Chad tipped the balance in the northeast. So, th the satellite images show over about six decades how Lake Chad collapsed from the size of a small sea now to the size of a small river. Mm. So, over that time, millions lost their means of livelihood around fishing and farming. And the governors in the Northeast, as it then was, and remember the- Didn't pay attention. Yes, and the first of them, of course, is the current president, mm. President Buhari, then a young military officer, and then became the first military administrator of Bornu State as well. So after Northeast, mm -hmm. which he governed, was split, he became governor no. of Borno State as well. Him and his successors, largely because they, are, they were not trained for this kind of thing. I mean, young infantry or artillery officers are not trained to understand climate change or development issues in mm, any Particularly way. in the 70s where it wasn't such a big global yes, conversation. Yes, right? but, but it was happening. The satellite images showed it. People living around there could were, see it, yeah, yes. And, and sort of warned about yes, it, that yes. there's going to be a major yes, impact and yes. nothing was and done. And nothing was done. So the problem became intergenerational. Genera several generations lost their fishing and farming livelihood. So the impact was then greater. So extremism on four sides of Lake Chad, Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and Cameroon. Mm took advantage of it to recruit and mobilize extremists. So that was the game changer in the Northeast. But people were not paying attention to the Northwest. I should say the Northwest also has a higher total fertility rate per woman. Essentially, this is the average number of children a girl or woman will have over her lifetime. So and we're now going into the question of birth rates. Yes. Are you suggesting and, and, you can also equality. make a link between birth rates, gender equity, and the troubles that we are currently seeing? Yes. And not just in Nigeria. Mm. In Central African Republic, Somalia, Okay, Democratic before we go Republic outside Nigeria, Congo. let's focus on Nigeria <laughs> yes. first. Help me understand that. What is the link between high birth rates, gender equity, and the troubles that we're seeing in the Northwest now? Well, to put it in one sentence, where there is a high birth rate and girls are forced into child marriage at 12, 13, 14, and before they are 30, have an average of seven to eight children, in reality, it could be as much as 11 or 12 each. That alone is bad as it is. If you multiply by polygamy, it means that each man specifically has brought into the world 
between 7, 14, 21, 28, sometimes up to 32 children. Mm. But, it, it but, means but you're not suggesting that the act, and, and we can have a whole conversation, obviously, around child marriage and mm. the issues with it, but mm. I, I want us to be able to sort of, I want people to really understand what we're saying. Mm. We, it's not so much the marriage in itself that is problematic or having children. The reason why this have become problematic is because there are no supporting infrastructure. So the children don't go to school. There's no job for the parents to do. Okay. And then it is children so, having children. Okay. It's not adults. Okay. So the problem is this. Okay. First of all, the forcing of girls into marriage mm -hmm. in some states say like in the Northwest, mm -hmm. it's between 60 and 83%. That marry from a very early age. Yes, okay. forced yeah. into marriage from a very early age, between 60 and 83% in each of the Northwest states. What this does, first of all, is obviously it violates the girls. Secondly, it pushes them into lifelong poverty. So... Forcing young girls into marriage from the age of 12, 13, 14, up to 60 to 83 percent per state, essentially means that they have no education, no job skills, no income, and in the highest in the state where it's highest, 83 percent, essentially 83 percent of all girls and women, are pushed into poverty. So that then creates the background for every other thing mm -hmm. that follows. Now, the first bath of the children themselves is the secondary problem because when there is no investment in schools or education for those children, the Poverty of their mothers especially becomes intergenerational. So the kids themselves then suffer hunger, malnutrition, and as you know... Because they're born to children like themselves. Yes, they're born to with, children, yes. Um, children who are not educated, who don't have a skill set, yes. who have no income, yes, and so cannot raise them. At all. At in, all, yes, really, yes, properly, yes, you know, and yes. what is expected... Yes. Okay. So in the first instance, hunger and malnutrition are always higher to children born to children. And that means that by the age of five, your intellectual and cognitive abilities can be damaged permanently. And, and I mean, this is real data. This has been yes. proven because I know that the Gates Foundation, for example, has been running a campaign trying to get people to understand in the north that the ages of zero to five mm. are critical Very. for for the development of a child's brain Very. and if the child doesn't get the right kind of nutrition mm. after the age of five is too late it's too late and, and this impairment what do they do and what do they make people susceptible to well the impairment essentially makes people susceptible to recruitment to banditry and extremism because it means that they can't rationalize their actions mm -hmm. and remember they are also in poverty so first the cognitive and intellectual abilities are impaired not of everybody but if you look at say katina and zamfara state where hunger and malnutrition is highest it was zamfara that had the highest about three, four years ago. It's now Katsina, 53%. This is the government's own report, the Food and Nutrition Report, 53%. Mm. Hunger I know and some nutrition. of the work that has gone into Zamfara, which is sort of what I sort of dialed it back a mm. little mm. bit, you know, because Zamfara is my state. Mm. So when you have it as high as 53%, 48 to 53% in both of those states, you're saying because half, more than half of all children born. Yes, that's what 48 to 53 percent means. So if the hunger and malnutrition is that high, it means their cognitive and intellectual ability is impaired. So they're in poverty, they can't rationalize things, they're easily lured into, in effect, gangs, 
which could be gangs of bandits or extremists. They are in large ungoverned spaces, and they are not even aware of the presence of the states. So their sense of right or wrong is effectively erased by multiple factors. They are not aware of what is happening. They can't rationalize what they are being pushed into. They are hungry. They are in poverty. They have no job skills. So effectively, the bandits or the extremists are reproducing an army that is susceptible to them. On October the 4th and 5th this year, multiple newspapers, but the Daily Trust in particular, led with a banner headline on it. The bandits and extremists in Niger State issued a statement saying that the communities, instructing the communities to ignore the government directives to send their children to school, and that girl children in particular, they were very specific, are to be forced into marriage no later than the age of 12. So, so, th mm. so th they are very deliberate yeah, about, that, about, about their about social engineering. engineering right. yes. and, 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 and so this is sort of part of the conversation I, I want to sort of have as well, because often you think of terrorists and for the majority of people, there's a degree of we think of them as mad people. Because in our head, no rational human being will do the things that they're doing. And yet, when you kind of sit down and look at some of what they do, they're even more intentional than our government in many, in many ways. They seem to be quite clear regarding what they're trying to do. So we have to assume there's a leadership that is fairly educated, understands how to manipulate communities, etc., etc. Would that be about correct? The leadership sees the big picture. They understand the kind of society they want to build. So they will social engineer it. Starting something we are not doing. Yes. So the, the, the state governments especially are not social engineering the kind of society that we expect they will build. Mm. So there is a vacuum. They are not investing enough in education. They are not building enough schools. They are not training enough teachers. They are not ending forced child marriage. Ideally, what we should see in the country is that the president and the governors of the 36 states, supported by the chairs of all the 774 local governments, should essentially sign a proclamation of freedom for girls, mm -hmm. saying that in upholding the Nigerian constitution, that all girls must be free to go to school. Mm. And, and that and, and, anything that prevents them from going to school, such as forced child marriage, will not be tolerated by the state. Why do you think this isn't happening? I mean, these things seem to be so obvious to me and to you. And when you explain them, I'm sure they're kind of now very obvious to everybody listening. Because Why is governance not seeing these obvious things that we're seeing and doing the right thing? Because some of the governors share the same big philosophical picture with these people we call bandits and extremists. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you an example from your home state of Zamfara. Yes. Zamfara once had a governor, Governor Yerima, who got himself a 13-year-old girl. I had that conversation with him. Yes. I actually interviewed him. So, yeah. so, the extremist bandits are not, you know, looking at him and saying, ah, the governor mm. shares And was the one of those at the Senate who pushed back when we were trying to, um, you know, push laws. Yes. That kind of outlawed these sort of things yes. and they sort of threw in the issue of religion and all of yes. that. Yes, but, but the important thing to note is that it's not religion. Mm. It's feudalism with an interpretation of religion. Okay. And before we go into the analysis, I want us to just go back a little bit. You know, we started this conversation with data that is 13 years old. Yes. Can we talk about what the recent data is okay. and what it shows, particularly for areas of the Northwest where we've seen violence that is unprecedented in many ways, particularly where you're not fighting a group that have an ideology? Mm. Okay. So let's look at state by state just to 
paint a clear picture. And we go back first about six years or so. Mm -hmm. So roughly halfway through the Boko Haram insurgency, the data from the Bureau of Statistics was showing us that in Yobe State, 83% of men had not had access to any formal education, primary, secondary, otherwise. This is men. Yes. It always was for women, by the way. Mm. But the men are the main That's fighting how bad force. It was, yes. Yeah. In Bornu State, 63%. So, in other words, only 17% in Yobe and 27% of men in Bornu had had access to any formal education mm. of any kind. That's what it was telling us six, seven years ago. If you look to the Northwest... But if, if farming was still a viable thing, yes, then, then we may not... Yes, yes. Because, you know, you don't necessarily need the sort of education yes, you and I are talking about yes, in order to sort of farm. Yes. But that puts together with the climate issues yes, we're facing... Yes, depressed the depressed Northeast, the accelerated northeast. it right. very rapidly. Now, the Northwest is not much different, not much far behind, just by about 10%. Sokoto, uh, uh, Katsina, Zamfara, Kebi, Jigawa, some parts of Kano and Kaduna, not you know, like 50, 53, 56, 57 mm. percent. So that's really high. Now, if you look at today, the overall picture, which is about 13 million children out of school, mm -hmm which shows us what will happen in the future. When they when become they're, young adults. Yes. When, That's 13 million, no jobs, no yes, skills. Yes, Probably underdeveloped mentally. Yes, yes. And so susceptible yes. to be manipulated yes, and used. Which is roughly double the number of about 12 years ago. We also have 60 million adults unable to read or write. This is the figure from the Minister of Education. Some of us think it's a bit higher than that. 60 million adults unable to read or write. Majority of them, women. But majority, majority of the men affected are from the Northwest and the Northeast. So you can see where this is going. The birth rate is still at 7.3 7 per woman. woman. Now, in places like Katina and Zamfara, where... Many of whom have no education. Yes. So they can't even educate their own At kids. all. At all. So, not only is the birth rate still 7, 7.3, 7.4 per woman in the Northwest, especially it's higher in the Northwest than in the Northeast, states like Katina and Zamfara, Katina especially, also has the highest polygamy rate in the country. Mm. So, this is where... 24, 28, 32 children are brought into the world by each man. So not surprisingly, Katina has the highest average class size in the country, about 100 children per class. That's average. In and, reality, and it's about And yet when I say polygamy is bad, people attack me and think you are attacking a religion or a way of life. They're not making the correlation between people's lifestyles and the results that we get as a community. So this is why it's important to look at the global picture. Mm -hmm. So countries like Turkey or Tunisia share the same religion. And as far back as the 1920s, those countries had started mass education campaigns and even legislation against forced child marriage and polygamy from about 1926. Mm -hmm. Tunisia, because they understood, because they understood the implications. Tunisia, by 1963, had started that campaign. In Libya, which collapsed for several dif different reasons, the age of marriage for girls is 21. Saudi Arabia, a year and a half ago, increased the age of marriage for girls to 18. 18. Mm -hmm and so forth, because a lot of those countries understand, say the case of Saudi Arabia, understand that you can't use oil money indefinitely to subsidize that amount of poverty 
amongst girls mm. because that's what they are doing because you know the guardianship method uh, the guardianship policy you can't go out you can't Without be seen in man, public yeah. with a man that is not your father your brother your husband or your son you can't effectively go in public transport which is why they changed the law to say women can drive essentially so they can go to work mm. and earn a living and contribute to the GDP because they see that the value of oil is dropping, which is something we should note in Nigeria. As because, well. Yes, mm. because by 2025, half of the highly developed countries would have stopped producing manufacturing cars that run on petrol or diesel. By 2030, all of them would have stopped. So it means all sales are going to drop. Saudi Arabia is looking at that and thinking we can't subsidize this amount of poverty anymore. So we, we need women mm. to work. And, and because the thing about gender equality, it's not just a rights issue. Mm. It also means that the per capita income and overall contribution... So it has, it has real tangible benefits yes. to the community yes. beyond giving women rights. Yes. But okay, which, so which are it, theirs. Yes, I, it, I understand it's not, that. We're, we're not, not giving women the rights. Yes, the, I know, but I'm saying that's how are they being put it. Yes, nice, yes. You know, that's how they put it, yes. we're giving them rights. Yes. But let me ask you this. I mean, recently, the governor of um, Kaduna State um, said, you know, he's looking at numbers in the north mm. and comparing it to Afghanistan. Mm. Now, these are things that we've also heard the former emir of Kano mm. talk to about again and again, whether mm. it's high birth rates and everything. Mm. Um, on current trajectory, if nothing changes, mm. based on your understanding of how data works, mm. what are you predicting for the northwest? and the Northeast? Maybe in about 10 years from now, uh, most of the states would have failed. If the interventions are not made mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. in about 10 years, the demographics will overwhelm the states, more or less. Haven't they done so Well, Katina and Zamfara have failed already. Mm. They are being propped up by federal military, military might. might right. If you pull the army out of Katsina, Zamfara, Yobe and Bono, the bandits and extremists will overrun mm. those states in a month or two. Mm. So at least four states have failed in Nigeria. And that's the thing to note. Let me say something quickly about local government. When states fail, they fail because communities have failed. So states fail community by community, local government by local government. So if a cluster of communities and local governments fail, then the state fails. And then those bandits or extremists then project into the next state and then mobilize similar demographics. And then the contagion just goes like that. So roughly in 10 to 12 years from now, if the current trajectory is on, probably be about 20 million children out of school, the number of Adults that can't read or write will probably be like 90 million, something like that. The poverty in the country, the latest UNDP report says about 93 million people mm. are severely affected by multidimensional poverty. That's more or less half the country. Mm. And when they say multidimensional poverty, what do they normally mean? You uh, know, when developmentalists talk about multidimensional poverty? Oh, it means... Uh, just to put it crudely, education poverty, food poverty, uh, all kind energy poverty. So shortages across yes. some of the most basic yes. things, you know, yes. um, healthcare, yes, health that poverty. sort of thing. And these things tend to come together and wreck communities. Yes. Can I mention quickly that mm. another driver of banditry and extremism is related to health. Maternal mortality is highest amongst teenage girls. Pregnancy-related Death. death is the biggest cause of death of so teenage girls. So they also girls. leave orphans behind. They also leave orphans behind. And when the orphans are left behind, the men just replace the girls like commodities. Mm. Senator Ndume pointed out that there are about 60,000 orphans in the IDP camps. I don't know if he was pointing at what I am pointing at because you know he's also the Senate chair of the, for the committee on the army, but mm -hmm. he's also from there. Mm -hmm. Now, he should have known immediately that even if just roughly half of those orphans 
uh, boys. That's potentially a few divisions, equivalent of a few divisions to be recruited by bandits. And, you know, orphans are like a blank slate yeah. because no values, no love, no care. So they, they no cleave training. to people who, yes. who sort of they yes. feel care about Yes, them. yes. And those kind of kids, if extremists get their hands on them, capture 100 farmers and say to show that you belong to the fold, we want all these farmers beheaded. It's most likely going to happen without any... I mean, we saw this happen in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, uh, places. So often these things are not Nigeria specific. We saw the warlords recruiting children in Sierra Leone and Liberia and using them to behead, amputate, and so forth like that. Mm. So these are like fairly basic sociological constructs that you can apply to most societies if the demographics are similar. So when Governor El Rufai said the Northwest especially is on the verge of being like Afghanistan, he's not wrong. He understands what we are talking about now. What he's not saying is that the current set of governors and in particular, their predecessors failed to shift the North away from feudalism, which is another name for inequality. Mm. And that's why I say it's not so much religion. It's the or ethnicity. Or et I in fact, it's, it's, it's not even that ethnicity. Is, we are dealing with class matters here. No, it's not even ethnicity at all. Yes, mm. it's inequality. It's class matters. So you can see the fear that a lot of the governors have of reformist feudalists like Sanusi, mm. the former governor of CBN, who understands clearly that the trajectory is going to doom the North, but because his rhetoric indicts them, they are afraid of him and want him off the scene very quickly. But, 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 what, but what they don't mm. realize is that unless they change and more or less take on board what people like him are saying, they will create the demographic forces that will remove them from office. And it's not going to be very nice. And it won't be pretty either. It won't be pretty. Won't That's be what I mean. Ballot box. No, be, no, no. Be. So look at Afghanistan. Mm. So about two decades ago, uh, or rather up to about two decades ago, Afghanistan had similar birth rates to Northwest Nigeria. There was UNESCO has pointed out that in the decade up to 2001, there was almost zero girls in school mm. with the same birth rate as Northwest Nigeria today. In effect, the Taliban reproduced an army by violating the reproductive and sexual health of girls, girls. and keeping them out of school. The same is happening in the Northwest and to a lesser extent to the Northeast. That's why I say, one, if you know the data globally, you understand the trajectory. A lot of people think many things are unique to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. It's not. Mm. So, I mean, I, I, you, you mentioned a few things that I want us to, before we sort of, I want us to talk about, okay, what can be done and why isn't it being done and where the issues are. But before we do, because you gave global examples, you talked about the collapse of Libya. You talked about what was happening in Niger and some of the neighboring states around Nigeria. Um, and, and I know that when I sit down now and look at sort of the map of conflict across the continent, I know that Islamist extremism, for example, is finding fertile ground within the continent, not just in Nigeria. So if you look at Al-Shabaab in um, Kenya, Somalia, mm. if you look at what's going on in Mozambique, mm. if you look at what's going on in Sahel, mm. in the Sahel, if you look at what's going on in Central African Republic, mm. and even coastal towns like Ghana, you know, um, their coastal areas are beginning to see extremists. Mm. Um, what do you think is going on? Is that like, do you think, have, has global jihadists, have global jihadists taken a decision that Africa represents, in your view, the best opportunity for setting up a home 
the, and an yes, empire. Yes, they are taking advantage of the demographics. That's that's what's and happening. And ungoverned spaces. Yes, yes, they are taking advantage of demographics. So m- myself and some colleagues that work on data and demographics and things, we mapped we mapped the world essentially six years ago mm-hmm. using data from official sources. sources. So the Bureau of Statistics of all the countries with reputable sources like the UNDP, UNESCO, and so forth. When we did the map, Mozambique stood out in Southern Africa. Mm. It was at the bottom of the Human Global Development Index. In Southern Africa. In Southern Africa. So you kind of knew almost yes, immediately yes, that that's where the, the yes, problems would yeah, begin. Yeah, it was re- Look, these things don't take... If you understand the data, it never takes you by surprise. The surprise is that the policymakers are not reacting to what people can see coming. Mm. And it's official sources. So they know. So in Nigeria, for instance, the head of the Bureau of Statistics sits in the National Executive Council meetings. When they produce reports, why don't they say to him or her, wherever it is, so you've produced this report and presented it. Please tell us what it means. Interpret mm-hmm. it. Tell us what the projections are. That's what is done in developed countries. If the ONS, say in the UK, the Office of National Statistics, puts out data, the head of the Bureau of Statistics in Nigeria sits in on the National Executive Council meetings. Mm. They don't say to him or her, you've produced a report, can you interpret it for us? Are you sure they don't And they don't. And are you sure they don't They don't. They don't. If, if they know, they don't care. Okay. If they know, they don't because care. Because this is, seems so obvious yes. as you explain it. Yes. And you have to wonder why a policy maker would not know this. If, if they know, they don't care. It's self-evident. Mm. It's not an allegation because mm. if they care, they would have acted. But if they said to him or her, the head of the Bureau of Statistics, interpret this to us and tell us in clear terms what you think is going to happen, then there would be on record advance warning. They broadly sidestep it and in fact act as if those reports do not exist because when you listen to the ministers, occasionally they admit things. So Nigeria, for instance, ironically, pushed for the at the UN for the International Day for Education, mm-hmm. which is now marked on the 21st of January. This was a Nigerian effort at the UN. So around that time, in the spirit of honesty and transparency, the Minister of Education says, even in Nigeria, we have a lot to do, 60 million unable to read or write. We have, in their own estimation, 10 million children out of school, which Mm -hmm. is not true, because they said they they reduced it by 3 million in the year of COVID, when no school opened and no new schools were built. Because... And bandits also had a field. Yes, play. closing yeah, down yeah, schools closing and down so schools forth. And everything, yeah. So they occasionally own up, but otherwise ignore the solutions. So, for instance, if it is 10 million children out of school, according to global standards recommended, 20 to 25 kids per class, essentially, you are looking at depending on availability of teachers, you know, and so on and so forth like that, at least 200,000 new classes, new classrooms, or 250,000, maybe 300,000, but at least 200,000. If you... Nobody's building No one is scale. building them on that scale because you need 200,000 new teachers. If you then Extrapolate. break down the data oh, okay. state by state mm. and say this is where the problem is worse, Maybe you are looking at 12,000 schools 
or 13,000 schools. So primary one, A, B, C, D, E, yeah. and then up to six from six. And then GSS one to SSS one, you know, sort of four or five wings, six classes like that. Where are those, where are those being built? Where are the teachers being trained? Yes. Okay, so the, the question about me is, look, um, w- the solution seems to be obvious and nobody is doing them. Why is it, do you think, that there's also been a failure to look at this, even if it is from a basis of enlightened self-interest? Because you and I know, based on what we've seen in other places, based on how Kabul was overrun. I mean, you talk to people in mm. Afghanistan mm. and they will, tell you, they will tell you they were sitting in the state capital and hearing about all these things in the ferry ferry of mm. in the Afghanistan, rural in the rural areas. Mm. Never once in their wildest imagination mm. did they think it will come to the capital city. Mm. And many of them, it took them by surprise. Yeah. The day these people... Sheer, sheer force of numbers. numbers. You know, when they plus, came in. Sheer force of numbers plus... If this was to happen in Nigeria, it would be because, for instance, the Hizba, if they formed the core of the state police, mm. wouldn't really have any big philosophical differences with the extremists marching mm. on the town mm-hmm. or the city. So if they then had the overwhelming numbers, mm. the Hizba or state police would just hand, join them. Yeah, just hand which, over to which them. Which brings me to the other issue around how we are. So th- th- there are obviously this is a multifaceted problem. It's a developmental issue. It's a governance issue, and I think we've spent a bit of time talking mm. about that. Can but I can we, I can yes. I make one point, please? Mm. A lot of the governors and the people at the federal level assume that they can crush the problem with brute force. That's their answer. That's their answer to it. Mm -hmm. But isn't it clear now, given the sort of lack of capacity we've seen, both in terms of just even something as basic as numbers, the numbers of police we have, the numbers of people in the army, the number of people in the air force, just based on that alone, we have been told that we don't have the numbers to sort of police properly. We don't have the numbers to use military force properly. So, um, the 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 question is, I mean, based on your analysis earlier, a brutal end awaits all of us in another 10 to 12 years if we don't sort sadly, this out. Sadly. Why isn't enlightened self-interest enough in your view? Why hasn't that at least been the basis for getting people who are in, in a position to do something, to do something about it? They are, they are delusional. Listen to the Minister of Information. He keeps saying they will be crushed. They've been crushed. They've been technically defeated. In another month, they will cease to exist Mm. and repeats it. And repeats it for six years and nothing changes. Well, people would argue things have gotten worse. Yes. Well, I mean, let's just say it doesn't get better. Mm. Now there's. 10 Tucano, Super Tucano aircraft, close ground Probably support. 12. 12, mm. okay. So, oh yes, the final batch has mm. arrived, okay. Mm. So, this is the new joker in the pack. Oh, in fact, they will be flattened, they will be crushed, they will be... I mean, I, I have interviewed, you know, the, the uh, spokesman for the Air Force, and um, I remember asking him what makes the Tucano special, and he gave me a very generic answer and said um, that it's not strategic for him to sort of talk in detail about what the capacity of the Tucano, because it will he should, allow people, he sh- the he people sh- they're he fighting, know. He should know better, because if it was a question of firepower, what firepower didn't the Russians have in Afghanistan, and what firepower didn't the Americans have in Afghanistan? They have at least two or three thousand times the firepower of the Nigerian Air Force or Army, and that is not to say that. No, but the you can't. To be, to be fair, though, with with our military people, um, they can only talk about what they do. So, to so, be fair, so that's you know, so I that's mean, the point I was going to yeah. make, and that that's not to say that the Army or the Air Force are not doing their best. But in the circumstances, they are 
fighting. They are hoping to win a war where no one is going to come to the table and sign the surrender papers because the issues we are talking about now are intergenerational. So even if they capture or remove the current leaders, if the demographics keep getting worse, they'll just be replaced replaced with more people. Mm. And then they will call for more firepower. Effectively, Effectively, what's happening is the army especially is being drawn into a capture and hold and occupy scenario. Mm. What should be happening is you capture, you hold, the government does the rapid investment, overwhelming shock and awe investment, Mm. free the girls from forced child marriage, build the schools for the boys and the girls. So in other words, you drop the birth rate Mm. for now and the next generation. The job skills eliminates the poverty. Mm. The infrastructure helps. The army then moves on. But what is happening now is that the army moves in, captures, holds, and stays. And then, then after a while leaves because they can't hold Yes, and then when they move, it springs up again. Yeah. Then they come back. And then it's like whack a mole. They are running from place to place like that. And after some time, they start saying it is sponsors. They are, they are chasing the sponsors. But it's the demographics. Look, in the case of Zamfara, effectively, they keep hoping that the military, and that's not what the military is designed to do. In fact, I feel a lot of sympathy, both for the rank and file of the military and the field commanders that are being put in this position. Because every time they are summoned and mm. given the final marching order that okay. the whole thing must end and within one know. week. Let, let's, let's not, you know, overflog that. Because I said, I want us to move regions now. I want us to talk about the Southeast. What is your assessment of what's going on in the Southeast? And are you able to make similar linkages with data that is available and between that data and what we are seeing as well, yes. beginning to sort of rear its head yes. in the Southeast? Yes. Tell me. But in a different way. Okay. So, it's important to understand in the Southeast this thing called the apprentice method. Some people understand, not many people, the historical origins, that at the end of the Civil War, the move to rebuild the Southeast drew a lot of young men into construction, supply, trading, and so forth. Partly because they had lost the opportunity to go to school for about five years. So I went to Government College Omaha shortly after the war Mm. ended. And in my class, we had many, in Form 1, we had many boys, young men that were shaving. They had literally just come from the front. Yes. So they were 19, 20, 21. in the army. In Form 1. Yes. Many could not go back to school. Those were the ones that could go back to school. Many could not go back to school because they'd lost their parents. The schools had been destroyed. So if they were about to go to Form 1 in, say, 67, 68, something like that, and they were 11, 12, 13, 14, by around 72, 73, when they had an opportunity to go back to school, they were 18, 19, 20. So many didn't go back. Lost parents had to survive, no schools. The reconstruction efforts created a lot of business people Mm -hmm. that drew in thousands of these young men. Now remember, this was the period of oil boom. This was the period of Udoji Award. So a lot of Nigerians had disposable income to buy fridges, Ions, TVs, TVs and things like mm. that. So the surplus capital from the business of rebuilding and so forth, especially when they came back to Lagos, was moved into importation of these items, hence Alaba Market and all these places. Mm. So they more or less monopolized the sale of electronics. 
as the economy slowed down, and for instance, people couldn't buy new cars and started buying what we call Tokumbo cars, it means you needed more spare parts, so they diversified into spare parts and things. All of what I'm hearing is of a people who are very resilient, yes. who are innovative, who sort of, you know, well, by, go flow with the circumstances by circumstances, make the best of it. Yes. Yeah, make the best of where they found but themselves. as the economy slowed down, the apprentice method slowed down. So some of my classmates in government college who were here who were unable to go to university like some of us, that went into that business, became very rich. And after had boys working, working for, for them. them. So you talk about the apprenticeships. Yes, and that's what yes. You mean, right? So they served within five or six years. By the time we were finished uni and we were going to do masters and things, they were mega rich. They had boys working for them. They because then they'd set been up, giving capital. Yes, they'd been giving up. capital. They then set up those boys. But as of about 10, 12 years ago, the orgas, the bosses, didn't have enough capital to set up the boys. So the boys that did not go to school, now this is intergenerational. They had assumed school is not important because in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, that apprenticeship system worked, worked and provided yes. affluence yes. and good work. So many of them income. assumed oh, education is for the girls who we'll join this. Plus, of course, some of them really genuinely had no access to education. Mm -hmm. That system slowed down. Now, many of those boys, six, seven, eight, nine of them, are sleeping in shops. There is large frustration. Why haven't we seen a concerted effort? So there's often, um, and these are conversations that don't happen in the open mm. many times, but there's often an, an, an assumption that, yeah, the North never really believed in education, was a little bit backwards, and so there was resistance to Western well, education. Well, not, not the North, the, the elites that run a feudal system. Yeah, but I'm just saying mm. there's a general assumption. Mm. So these are conversations that when people are having sort of generic... Oh, they say, yeah, the Northerners don't, Northern want, to don't to want to go no, to school. No, with that, right? that's complete nonsense. And No, but I'm just saying mm. there's an assumption that, you mm. know, okay, the North doesn't want to... But mm. it is always assumed that in the South, mm. most people would want to go to school. So why haven't we seen that translate into education for boys in the South East, which might have provided alternative employment. Because for a while, those that didn't go to school were able to make it economically. So it was assumed it didn't matter. Whereas, so that became like the narrative for that yes, reason. Right? Yes, whereas in the North, for instance, first child marriage, polygamy, hunger, malnutrition, and so forth, grew at a more rapid rate. So that's a bigger demographic problem. And by the way, first child marriage does happen in other parts of the country. Yes, I know. In Biosa State, it's 50%. So mm. it's one in two. And that's as bad as you can get, mm. one in two, 50%. Mm, percent, so yeah. in Lagos, I always remind people, which is 20 million people, if first child marriage is 10%, that's 10% of 10 million women yeah, yeah. not so so, yeah. so the numbers are yes, still substantial yes, is what you're saying yes it's just that it doesn't have the same social impact as 83 percent of, of even if it's a smaller of place, two million. million yeah i hear you i hear you so, so zamfara four million people yes 80 percent yes is different from 10 percent of 20 yes uh, of, of, 10 million, of 10 million, million, million in lagos plus lagos has a lot of commercial opportunities because it's a small state it's okay. densely packed it's a port city there's industrialization so even those girls that would have otherwise been pushed into poverty are selling things even if it's on the roadside. Okay. We're running out of time, and okay. I, I don't want to sort of bore people okay. without sort of, so, you know, landing and concluding. So okay. the, the South the East, South given East. what's going on there okay. now, what are your sort of so, prognosis so, for that so place? So as about 10 years ago, essentially, the data was showing that in the South East, if anyone carried a separatist or secessionist flag and said, if we go our way, we will make it. The person would have found people to follow him or her. That's what the data shows. Mm. 
as at least 10, 12 years ago. Don't forget, there was massive yes. the movement for the actualization yes. of the sovereign yes. state of Biafra. Yes. So, yeah, so this is not new. What has happened now is that there is a an absolute higher number of frustrated young men who don't understand what is happening. So there will always be separatists. There will always be extremists. There will always and be so bandits. And so it's easier to sort of blame what's going on on sort of what they believe. Yes. In, because there is a historical yes. so, and a perceived yes, marginalization yes. So, and on unhappiness yes. and all of that. So right? in the Southeast, the absolute... Uh, uh, the, the number of these young men that is growing has fed into the post-Civil War narrative that the three hours didn't really happen, especially mm -hmm. the reconciliation and the reconstruction, that it didn't really happen, that they were still marginalized, they were still excluded, and that if they go their way, they will do better, they will do better and so on and so forth. So that is why that level of militancy can be tapped into and grow. If it's not Nam uh, Kano, again, it would be somebody someone else. else. And, but, but again, it's the same issues in the North as well, where a military solution is not going to do it. It won't. It? Because you have to sort of deal it with won't. the underlying yes. issues. Let, let me give you a quick example. Mm. Ariaria Market in Abba is one of the biggest industrial hubs in West Africa, manufacturing of shoes, bags, things like that, clothing. In the section of the markets that does the manufacturing, they spend billions on generators every year. Mm. Billions, tens of millions a month. They use kerosene-powered uh, uh, equipment mm. to melt the glue that they use for the, for the bags shoes. and the shoes and things like that. If they had grid power their output would be about 10 or 20 times higher. They would be able to employ more people. Why don't <laughs> they have great power, mm -hmm. make more profit, employ more people? There is only one disco servicing the entire Southeast, the Enugu disco. Mm. So big picture, Nigeria as a whole needs about 200,000 megawatts, megawatts of power. The global sustainable development standard is 1,000 megawatts per 1 million people. So we should be at 200,000 megawatts. We're at 5,000. When the grid and collapses... And even that's five sometimes. Yes. When the grid collapses, we're at zero. To give you an example, Qatar, 2.9 million people, roughly the same population as Ali Moshe local government, has 10,000 megawatts of power. of power. So they are going to host the World Cup next year, mm. partly because so, of power. So if the Southeast, or for that you know, the, the whole of Nigeria had more power. There would m be more industry, more employment. There would still be people saying they want to but, but, but separate. People, people would have a stake in society, is what you're saying. Yes. They're less likely to rebel against a community where you feel, um, you know, rooted and ownership and yes. you, know, you have something to lose. Yes, but, but, but th there's an important point to mm -hmm. make there mm -hmm. with this power thing. Mm -hmm. So Nigeria is a federal country. It's possibly the only federal country in the world, to the best of my knowledge, where the country is not only run like a unitary state, things like power, generation, and distribution I are see, centralized. Yeah. Because if you go to Germany... Australia, U.S., and places like that, states generate, if, even in South Africa, but, they but recently well, raised the cap. Te te technically, though, we now have distribution companies that are regional, right? The only thing that has remained centralized is the transmission. So then the, 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 the central grid, and the argument has always been that you should have regional grids, or even smaller grids, mini grids. The, the generating, be. so the Jenkos, even as they are designed, are designed like a unitary system. They're if, regional, though. If the states... So, for instance, so let me put it differently now. The southeast states or the northwest states or the southwest states can't come together and say, 
we are forming our own Jenko. It has to pass through the federal process. No, I hear you. I hear you. And, and, and I mean, people have always made the argument that you should be able to do a power mix that takes advantages of the um, natural endowments of a place. Yes. So if a place is gas producing, yes. you know, focus on trying to give them power with yes. gas. The North maybe spend a bit more money on solar. Um, even though coal is not a thing, there are parts of the Southeast that if you chose to, you could power with coal. Even places like Kogi. And then, of course, the hydro dams, you know, for places where there's water. So I, I hear you about the lack of, lack of mix, but I don't want us to digress mm. into sort of a conversation around. I, I hear the point you're mm. making around the economy, but I want us to wrap up by asking you. So there are people sort of sitting in this country who continue to see some of these problems from a regional perspective. So if you're sitting in Lagos and you're looking at sort of armed men going on rampage in Enugu, or in Imo state. There's a part of people that would by and large say, well, it is them, them, you know, that kind of thing. They are sorting themselves out. I've heard certainly a lot of it when it comes to the problems initially in the Northeast and the Northwest about, well, you know, is there Wahala? Should other parts of Nigeria that are relatively safe, and I say use the word relatively because, you know, there are problems everywhere, but relatively safe, should they be worried about the data you've just shared and the implications of what happens in these regions? Or can they actually isolate themselves from yeah. these issues by doing the right thing, say, for their people? If, if some states or geopolitical zones do the right things, they will slow down the collapse of their states or geopolitical zones, without any doubt. But it has to be everywhere. Why? Because if it exists anywhere, to the extent that it degenerates, to that extent will the federal government feel compelled to use federal resources that everybody should be using for development, for warfare. So... Does the answer therefore lie in what some people are agitating for, which is that, look, you northerners, you've allowed your place to be messed up. You've had an opportunity in government at various levels. You didn't fix it. And now you're threatening to drag all of us along. Because you mustn't forget, data has shown that if you extract the north from Nigeria, to a certain extent, we won't be at the bottom of development indexes for the globe for the globe will be sort of a middle country so so when people say break it up don't they have a point well it's very complex and we can't sort it out even in one hour never mind in 10 minutes so different countries have found solutions to ethnic, regional, or language issues. You know, Canada has its own solution, the French-speaking and the English-speaking, the Swiss have their own solution, rotational presidency, and so forth like that. We'll have to find our solution to it. But if anyone is under the impression that a physical break will automatically translate into El Dorado, the person is mistaken. But why? why? Yeah, so if there's so a group that is, let's say the Southwest, they've done fairly okay with education, is relatively homogeneous when it comes to language, they have ports, you know, they have Lagos, which is sort of on its own a small country, if yeah. you look at the numbers and everything. Why can't the Southeast say, Southwest say, you know what, I am tired of the mess and you guys refusing to send your children to school, forcing your daughters to get married early, and just your general worldview because is not similar to mine. I'd actually like to have my own country. What's wrong with that? Okay. In principle, there is nothing wrong with it. But if the assumption is that it will translate a particular region into El Dorado, it's mistaken. It's worse in the Northwest because the demographics are worse in the Northwest. Don't forget, I was pointing out in the beginning, the broad sweep of 70 
percent of kids in primary school not going not to going to secondary school yeah. affects places like Lagos. That's how you have all the towns and that bureaus and people selling things on the road. That's how you have it. Now Lagos or the Southwest will not collapse as quickly as the Northwest. But unless there is 100% universal primary and secondary education, unless the power goes up to 20,000 megawatts, unless the multidimensional poverty is reduced all around as we've discussed, eventually Lagos will become an urban jungle whether it's in 20 or 30 years' time. Don't forget what I was pointing out. Nigeria's population overall will double to about 400 million in about 30 years. Mm -hmm. Long before then, the oil will I'm listening be to these numbers, and I won't lie to you. What do you mean? I'm scared. Everybody should be. I am, I'm really Everybody listening to you, be. and I'm scared, yeah. particularly because I'm not seeing anything in our planning because, because that sort of suggests that we are taking these things no, seriously and treating even, them like an emergency. Because Lagos or the Southwest may seem better than the Northwest. But once... So imagine if Lagos population doubles to 40 million in 30 years. And things years, are still exactly And this. things are like this. So Lagos then doesn't have 20 to 40,000 megawatts of power. 70% of the kids in Lagos that start primary school are unable to transit to secondary school and so forth. There will be parts of Lagos that an average person cannot walk into without protection. Mm. So it will be different from the Northwest. But it will still be problematic. But it will still be problematic. So the assumption that just breaking away physically solves all the problems for all time is not correct. Okay, so I've asked about the link between sort of the, the regions, but how much of what is happening in the rest of Africa should also worry us, and how much of it needs to be taken into account when we are sort of doing policy ourselves and putting things, you know, plans in place? So I've had the advantage of working at the African Union level for... About six to seven years, I did a lot of work with the African Union Commission on Development and Health Financing, engaging ministers, the ministerial conferences, uh, finance, planning, economic development, health, gender, youth, and so forth like that. Speakers of parliament, the Pan-African Parliament, several heads of state summits, so making presentations, data, arguments, suggestions, and things like that, I got fed up because it seemed reasonably clear that not all of them were taking it as seriously as, as they should. As they should. Mm -hmm. To be quite honest, I learned a lot, and I'm sure we all shared in a lot of knowledge, but the 20 years or so I spent outside working outside Nigeria, at least seven of those years were spent working in and around the African Union and its various organs. Now, the first thing is they are not paying attention to the human development indicators on a continental scale. And that is why extremists are picking up faster than the governments that there are parts of Africa, especially in West Africa and the Sahel, where they can embed themselves and grow very rapidly. Once so, that happens, they link up across countries, the most vulnerable parts of countries. And my educated guess is that they would try and do what they did in Syria, what they tried to do in Syria mm. and Iraq which is to build their own interpretation of a state, mm -hmm. they are going to try and do it across the Sahel and West Africa in the first instance. Do we have a chance at all, Ruth? Well, the chance is that... So, the same way that in Nigeria, when 
an emergency is declared. Our president does not convene the Minister of Education and the 36 Commissioners of Education to say, guys, so the Army, the police, Air Force, we do their thing. But you guys, the Commissioners for Youth, Education, Gender, 36 of you in all the 36 states and Abuja. So it could be 72 people. It could be 140 people. Mm. We need you guys to come up with a plan to, one, stop this situation where girl children are used to reproduce a potential army for the bandits and extremists. This 300,000 classrooms that we need and 300,000 teachers, we need them built, trained, equipped in two or three years mm. maximum. The youth skills, the vocational For training. For those who don't have the skills and yes, don't go to school, yes, what are we going to do yes, to rapidly the, scale up? Yes, the vocational training we need for the 60 million that can't read or write. Because don't forget, for them, if we're talking of two to 300,000 classrooms for the kids out of school, for the adults that can't read or write, we are talking of about a million vocational mm -hmm. classrooms mm -hmm. for them. So that means a lot of investment in teaching, schools and so forth, youth skills development, infrastructure to soak up the unemployment. And how do we deal especially. with issues around climate change? So, so let me just make one other point. So the same way our president is not doing that, it's the same way that at the AU or the ECOWAS level, because you see, when they call security summit around Lake Chad, they call the ministers of defense. Mm. They don't call the ministers of education, youth, gender, agriculture, environment, and so forth, mm. and say, what is the solution on the four sides of Lake Chad? They call the ministers of defense. That's where the weakness to the solution is. If we change that, then Nigeria and Africa would have a better chance. There is the bigger problem. But you have still not answered my question. Which is? Do we do we stand a chance? Yes, I said Nigeria you and said Africa if, would have. If, if. Yes, would have a better. Well, without that, there is no chance. Right. Without that, there is no chance. People act like we don't know that empires and countries have collapsed in our lifetime. We are not talking of ancient Rome. Mm -hmm. Yugoslavia in the middle of Europe collapsed and there was massive war in the place and so forth. We've seen countries disappear in our lifetime. If the correct things are not done, my educated guess is that from, say, 2031 to 2050. You think we have that much time left? I am not too well, sure. Well, because, because, like I said, states fail community by community. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if the whole one country... Would, collapse, yeah, yeah, right? there, there won't be one big bang. Mm. It will be gradual. Gradual. Yes. I mean, like in Democratic Republic of Congo, it didn't happen one day. Yeah. It was gradual, gradual, gradual until Mobutu fled on the last plane. Mm -hmm. And after that, militias just took up mm. different parts of the and country. And they're still there. And they're Even still there. Even though there is the illusion of some sort of central government. Well, the last time I was there many years ago on an AU-related kind of thing, you couldn't go outside uh, the capital without mm. military escort. So mm. maybe that's what will happen here in 20 or 30 years. So unless that is really taken into account... Maybe in 50 years from now. The thing is, that's already the case in places like Zamfara, though, because, you know, I just came back from there and um, my reporting was not possible without, um, yeah. without so, security. So state by state, community by community first, local government by local government, state by state, that's how countries fail. And because the federal failure is what comes last, there's the, so often an illusion. There is an illusion and they hold out threatening that they will be finished, the new equipment, the new surge, the new... Look, two days before Kabul fell, 
the central government was still swearing it was never going to happen. President Biden said he he does not anticipate that this will happen. And if it if at all it happens, it will take months or years. It happened in two weeks. Because, Literally hours, actually, yes. if you consider it. As well, soon as they showed up, everybody just made Yes. Away. In fact, if you see the uh, foreign minister for Afghanistan, the properly Western educated, very articulate, he was being cheeky on Al Jazeera. He said, oh, no, we didn't uh, uh, take over Kabul. We turned up at the city gates and they all fled. <laughs> so we had to step in. He was in. mocking. Yes, he said we had to step in to prevent looting and uh, collapse of society. That's what he said with a straight face. So similarly here, look, you can see what's happening on the Abuja Kaduna rail. You can see what's happening in Kaduna State, in Niger State, and you know, it's really close to Abuja. I mean, how long? How long? So there are a lot of things that could come together very rapidly and tip Nigeria over. It won't happen, in my estimation, to scale for at least another 10 to 12 years. Whoever wins the elections, federal and most of the states in 2023, their second term will end in 2031. And if they don't put in yes. the work, essentially... Th that that be will be the beginning of the end, mm -hmm. more or less. Mr. Roti, Mr. Ankore, thank you so much for joining me on Quarter to Twelve to explain these numbers, which um, are very, very significant and can actually tell us the future. Thank you so much for Thanks spending God time right. with us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You have been watching Quarter to Twelve, and I was speaking to Mr. Roti, Mr. Ankore, a journalist and developmental expert, about our demography, about the numbers around uh, child mortality, about um, maternal health, and how all of this really can give an indication um, of the state of the country and what we can expect when it comes to conflict. Thank you, and join us again next month for another edition of Quarter to Twelve.